climate is a common good. The climate is a common good belonging to all and meant for all. Success project um, is is aimed to uh, to advance the renewable energy agenda in the Philippines and and to the transition to a low carbon energy path. And the project can really help to unlock important opportunities for advancing the renewable energy agenda in the country, in the Philippines, uh, in relation to the policy framework. I think the, the real achievement of, of this and the asset program and sales project is the transformation of the, of the lives of the people and the beneficiaries of this. Uh, Okay. All right. So good morning, everyone. So welcome to the Energy and Sustainable Development Webinar brought to you by the Ateneo School of Government and the Ace of Cells Project. I'm Camille Joy Analdez, the Advocacy and Communications Officer of the Ace of Cells Project, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies for this morning. So for the information to everyone, we are live via Zoom and the Facebook page of the Ateneo School of Government and the Ace of Cells. So now, I know that many of us have, have been attending webinars for the past three months or so. And I hope that today's webinar will add to your knowledge and hopefully, hopefully increase your interest on clean energy. So we are hold, also holding this webinar in honor of Father Jed Villarin, who will be ending his three distinguished terms as president of the Ateneos uh, de Manila University this, um, this month, I believe. And, I am happy also to acknowledge the presence of all our viewers, our colleagues from the academe, the government agencies, civil society, diplomatic community, and the media. So now um, we can see that we currently have 188 participants or viewers on Zoom alone, and we have some more coming in on Facebook. So everyone, please feel free to share the live stream on your Facebook accounts and use the hashtag Energy and Sustainable Development Webinar. Okay, so now to officially begin our program, I will give the floor to our Dean, the Ateneo School of Government, to give the welcome address and introduce our keynote speaker. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our very own Dr. Ronald Yu Mendoza. Thank you very much, Camille. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Ateneo de Manila University community, I would like to welcome you to this webinar on energy and sustainable development. I am pleased to acknowledge our participants, notably the Vice President of the Philippines, Her Excellency, Vice President Maria Leonor Herona Robredo, our panel of experts, including Senator Sherwin Gachalian, 
Secretary Alfonso Cusi, former Secretary Babe Singson, former Secretary Popo Lotilia, Dr. Jop Yap, Cecil Benavides, Ivy Bicic, and Dr. Lawrence Delina. We also take this opportunity today to honor the Ateneo de Manila University's 30th president, Father Jet Villarin. We are compelled to adopt this online format in response to the unprecedented pandemic that has battered our country. The adverse impacts of the spread of the COVID-19 virus traverse the physical, economic, social, cultural, psychological, and political well-being of our society. In the economic sphere, the pandemic has delivered a possible triple whammy. First, we definitely have a demand shock as the lockdowns has caused massive unemployment and a sharp reduction in purchases of non-essential goods. Second, there has also been a supply shock as supply chains have been disrupted because several small and medium enterprises have been forced to shut down and transportation systems are severely limited. Finally, there is also potential financial shock as many loans are left unpaid due to the aforementioned demand and supply shocks, thereby putting stress on some banks and other financial institutions. Similar shocks have buffeted the energy sector in particular. Demand for electricity in the wholesale electric spot market or WESM fell by 20% last April and 15% last May compared to the same period last year. During the period of enhanced community quarantine, electricity consumption dropped and largely shifted to the residential sector. Decreased demand and shifting load curves have likely led to a decline in the profitability of the power sector across its entire value chain. Meanwhile, the pandemic has also reduced construction activities and caused supply chain disruptions affecting all power generation technologies, as well as transmission and distribution. As the International Energy Agency succinctly describes it, the crisis has curbed investments in the energy sector and threatens to slow the expansion of clean energy technologies. At this stage, it is not too early to anticipate the most effective way to mitigate the adverse impacts of the pandemic on the energy sector. We can be guided by the recent publication of IEA titled World Economic Outlook Special Report on Sustainable Recovery, released just June 18, 2020. An important area is the government stimulus packages that will accompany recovery programs. The IEA Sustainable Recovery Plan shows it is possible to simultaneously spur economic growth, create millions of jobs, and put emissions into structural decline. One way to accomplish this is to put retrofitting of government buildings to promote greater energy efficiency at the center of the short-term component of the stimulus packages. That is one way to build back better. Another way is to strengthen our healthcare system so that the nation becomes more resilient to present and future health shocks. We are eager to hear from our experts today about their views on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the energy sector and map ways through which the sector could emerge stronger. We also look forward to a discussion on plans of the government and the private sector in using the energy sector as a platform towards sustainable recovery. The Ateneo School of Government has organized this webinar partly because it is implementing a project titled Access to Sustainable Energy Program, Clean Energy Living Laboratories or ASEP Cells. This is in partnership with the European Union and the Department of Energy. An additional important reason for today's event is that the general topic of sustainable development is close to Father Jet's heart. Our honoree today, Father Jet, has made addressing the problem of climate change his primary mission in his academic career. He is currently the chairperson of the Manila Observatory and a member of the National Panel of Technical Experts of the Philippine Government's Climate Change Commission. His past work on climate change included being lead reviewer of greenhouse gas emissions inventories of parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and a member of the conservative, uh, consultative group of experts for developing countries. Father Jet was a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. In 2000, he was declared National Outstanding Young Scientist, and in 2002, his book, Distributing, Di sorry, Disturbing Climate, was given an Outstanding Book Award by the National Academy of Science 
and technology of the Philippines. Father Jet's distinguished career as a climate action advocate mirrors his accomplishments as president of Ateneo de Manila University. We do not have enough time this morning to go through the accomplishments during his nine-year term, but allow me to please highlight some of the major milestones. Creation of learning, innovation, and collaboration hubs, foremost among which is the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability. Strengthening research to the university, including but not limited to the establishment of the research faculty track, research clusters, and international research partnerships. Overseeing the university's successful transition to K-12, a new core curriculum in college, and a new academic calendar, as well as co-education in the senior high school. Expanding the university's social engagement, an example of which is the Disaster Response and Management or DREAM team, which is currently at the forefront of providing assistance to our fellow citizens adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. On a more personal note, Father Jet has been a staunch supporter of our reforms in the Ateneo School of Government and our efforts to grow the reach and impact of our policy research and teaching work. The first ever scholarships for ASOG students have been inaugurated under Father Jet's watch, including the Dean Dina Abad Emerging Leaders Fellowship for Young Public Servants and the San Ignacio de Loyola Valor Scholarship for deserving men and women leaders in our national security sector. As part of our mission to support good governance in the country, Father Jet also oversaw the creation of the Ateneo Policy Center, which hosts timely research on challenging political and economic issues, such as the joint UP LaSalle Ateneo research on the anti illegal drugs campaign. ASOG is therefore very honored to organize this webinar to commemorate Father Jet's three distinguished terms as president of Ateneo de Manila University. At this point, I would like to briefly introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Lawrence L. Delina, who is an assistant professor at the Division of Environment and Sustainability at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. His research interests include rapid mitigation of global climate change, accelerating sustainable and just energy transitions, and nonviolent climate mobilizations research areas which dovetail with those of Father Jet. Dr. Delina has published several books and journal articles in this field. We are quite privileged that he is able to join us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Delina. Maraming salamat po, uh, Dean Ron. Uh, I would like to acknowledge um, Vice President Lenny Robredo who is watching us uh, the, this, in this webinar. Um, also would like to acknowledge uh, Senator Sherwin Gatsalian, uh, Senator, uh, Secretary Alfonso Pusi, uh, former Secretary uh, Rogelio Singson, and former Secretary Rafael Lutia. And of course, um, Father Jet Villarin, uh, thank you so much for your nine year uh, service as, as President of the Ateneo. Very honored to, uh, to deliver this keynote address, this keynote lecture uh, in, in, in honor of your, of your three term presidency. And of course, for those everyone watching on their phones, uh, in their kitchens, uh, in their laptops, tablets, or wherever, uh, mga kapwa ko Pilipino, magandang umaga po. Uh, we have actually prepared a recorded uh, presentation, recorded lecture, so uh, considering the state of internet in, in the Philippines at the moment. So I'll ask um, Camille and the rest of the ASO team to, to, to play the, uh, the, the recording. Father Jet Villarin, uh, former Secretary Singson, former Secretary Lutilia, ladies and gentlemen, mga kapwa ko Pilipino, magandang umaga po. Um, una sa lahat, let me first thank um, Dean Ron Mendoza, uh, Dr. Joseph Yap, and Dean Tony Lavinia for this uh, kind invitation. I'm very honored to deliver this uh, keynote in honor of Father Jet Villarin's three-term presidency at the Ateneo de Manila University. I may not be an Atenean, but I share Father Jet's interest on our global climate system. Uh, and of course, um, Ateneo de Manila University School of Government and the Manila Observatory's work on, uh, on this issue, including, of course, on, on energy. Father Jet is not only an able university administrator, he is also a climate scientist. Uh, Father Jet's work with the IPCC has landed him along with uh, several colleagues all over the world 
um, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, an honor he, uh, he shared with uh, then Vice President Al Gore. The following year, 2008, was momentous for me personally. It was the year I left the country for postgraduate studies. And um, it was also the year I started my work on the climate, albeit not on understanding the basic climate science, but on explicating its policy and governance, a work that I am continuing today as an assistant professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So 2008 was, uh, 2007, 2008 were watershed years for my, um, for my own personal uh, development as a, as, as a climate scholar. Um, today I will be talking about energy transitions. So energy transition offers us one way, indeed the most important way, to address the key driver of anthropogenic uh, uh, or human-made climate change that of greenhouse gas emissions from the uh, energy sector. This transition encompasses the ways we generate electricity that provide lights to our homes, uh, power our industries and make the movements of people and goods possible. All this has to transition, all these energy services has to shift their energy sources to more sustainable and renewable energy resources from wind, from water, from sunlight, and in, in our case in the Philippines, from the heat of the earth or geothermal energy. Obviously, we still do not know when um, COVID-19 will become history or whether it will indeed become one. The possibility of living in a world alongside this virus is indeed not a remote one. Regardless, the present pandemic has fractured the ways we live now and most especially in the future. This tragedy will have profound effects for future generations. Decisions made today will lock us in the many years to come. So these decisions include the ways in which we are transitioning towards cleaner, sustainable, sustainable, reliable, and affordable energy, especially in the context of another important emergency, that of the climate crisis. And of course, um, doing this all together as we also contribute to meeting the global agenda of sustainable development for all. Indeed, there is now a collective and general understanding that the changing climate has ushered us into a planetary crisis, an emergency that scientists like Father Jet um, have persistently warned us during the last 10 to 20 years. This transition, however, will not only work towards mitigating the impacts of climate change for future generations. Indeed, um, that shift towards more renewables also means that we can harvest a number of targets in the Sustainable Development Goals or the uh, SDGs. In my talk today, I will focus on how we can envisage that a just, a fair, and an inclusive energy transition in the Philippines. I will start by looking quickly at how renewable energy fared during the first quarter of this year, at the time when lockdowns were instituted, not only in the Philippines, but all over the world. As you can see from this slide, uh, we see that electricity demand have actually been dropping to Sunday levels under conditions of lockdown all over the world. The dramatic reduction in terms of electricity de demand can be seen in the services and industry, but these are only partly offset by uh, increasing use of energy in, 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 in our homes. However, uh, of all the sectors, the service-based economies are suffering, are suffering the most. This slide here shows that for the first time in, uh, in half, of century, half a century, low carbon technologies are overtaking coal as the leading source of electricity in 2019, and they are moving further ahead in 2020. They meaning solar PV, um, wind, and other renewables. This slide here shows the global energy related carbon dioxide emissions uh, are set to fall nearly 8% this year to their lowest level in a decade. Um, contributing most to that reduction is reduced um, use in, in, in coal. Experience, however, suggests that after a certain or a key um, crisis, large rebound in terms of, of emissions is also likely. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, it's, it will not be unusual if, uh, if we ever uh, get out of the pandemic, we will see uh, emissions uh, shooting upwards. But the the, during also this period, the share of renewable energy penetration in, in the United Kingdom was at a record high of 45%. Uh, in Germany, it was 52%, and in the entire European Union, it was 48%. Uh, I don't know what the figures are in the Philippines uh, or, or some other countries, in comparative countries in Asia and the Pacific, but I assume it's almost um, the same. 
what can we expect for the future of renewables globally then? Some observers say that it will, uh, it will be more likely growth, though it will not be as fast as we expect it to be. Renewables will grow, they will indeed grow, while coal and gas will continue to decline. As shown in Europe, for example, it is possible today to operate power systems with high renewables. However, it will be, again, as I've said, um, slower. Renewable energy capacity additions have also dropped somehow. Uh, electric vehicle sales are also down. Global supply chain for renewable energy technologies, so talking about wind turbines, solar PV, have been disrupted, considering that our modest manufacturing capacity in the Philippines is largely dependent on um, Chinese manufacturers for majority of our solar cells and modules. Um, while it is clear that the impacts of the pandemic on energy transition is not yet set, we have already seen how the crisis reveal in terms of the importance of diversification, of integration, and sustainability of energy generation. We now have to buttress up the ways we think about the future of our energy transition governance arrangement. Having said that, the resiliency of our energy systems have to be front and center among these new considerations. In planning the post-pandemic recovery, energy transition should be a catalytic, catalytic force for rebooting our economy while redirecting energy in the direction of more resilience. For example, we need more health infrastructure to manage the health emergency that can be uh, energy resilient through decentralized renewable energy. Here I would like to mention ASAP cells ongoing work to build capacities of our institutions and increase public engagement on the imperatives of energy transition in the Philippines. Energy resiliency is also taking the core of my current research, including with my collaborators at the University of the Philippines Diliman College of Engineering. So as the COVID-19 pandemic continue to affect our lives and our livelihoods, our insecure situation also continues. For all the extreme uncertainties today, we know for certain that pandemics pass. If yes, it will. It will pass. What the pandemic has shown us is that uh, we could no longer remain oblivious of other systemic risks. Our complacency to address the risks to our planetary environment posed by thoughtless economic development has to end. While we could not force many Filipinos to think about the climate emergency, at a time when finding food remains an urgency, paying a bit more attention to respecting our planetary boundaries and to stop pretending that they do not exist have to be in the agendas of good government. As soon as the immediate crisis has passed, and especially when attention moves to reviving our economy, um, I think that's the important time to ensure that just energy transition from accelerating renewable energy deployments to cleaner transport to smart infrastructure is at the heart of the stimulus. I would like to underline some ways how might this may be achieved. Uh, pursuing a 100% electrification of all energy service, so energy service from electricity to transport and industry is key. And let me go back quickly to energy resilience because a 100% renewable energy system also speaks of resilience. And 100% renewable energy is um, technically uh, plausible for our context here in the Philippines. A resilient energy system is about a lot of things. It means utility scale storage, uh, e electric vehicle smart charging, uh, renewable energy to heat, um, AI, artificial intelligence, big data, blockchain, renewable energy mini grids for our many off-grid islands, and of course, super grids for our three major grids. A resilient energy system is also about new business models. Uh, it includes aggregators, P2P electricity trading, and energy as a service, as well as community ownership models. And a resilient energy system is also about market design, including time of use tariffs, uh, market integration, and time of use distributed uh, renewable energy. A resilient energy system is also about system operation, which includes the future role of distribution system operators, uh, advanced forecasting of variable renewable energy, and innovative operation of pumped hydro storage. While supporting renewable energy projects is a must, um, addressing the structural issues that, um, that is holding back renewables deep penetration into grids in our country, however, is much more important. And I have to stress here the structural impediments to renewable energy transition in the Philippines. 
Um, we have people from government as well as from the energy industry with us today. Um, I assume to have a keen understanding of these impediments. I know they know what the challenge, these challenges are about, and they also know the ways by which we can address these barriers. I will not belabor myself to repeat what our friends, what, um, what our advocate friends in the anti-coal movement and the movement towards 100% renewable energy Philippines have been pushing hard for many years to make the case for energy transition in a renewable energy rich country. Instead, let this be a pleading to, um, to our friends in government and in the energy sector to do the right, uh, the moral and the ethical thing, and that is to process energy transition as quickly as we can. Going back to stimulus, so as we design these packages, it is also incumbent for a good and a thoughtful government to ensure that no bailouts should be made available to industries and business models that are not viable in the coming low carbon world. So this includes low cost airlines, coal fired power generation, and the uneconomic operation in oil and gas. Uh, yes, I plead guilty with regards to air travel, my line of work had demanded for it. But if we are to take the climate emergency seriously, we could not return to that abnormal way of life. And I'm not returning to that way of life. The future of transport for the Philippines is electric. Electric vehicles powered by renewables would mean that uh, coal-fired power generation has to stop and there should be a moratorium on new and, and planned coal-fired power plants. The studies after studies, we were shown that 100% renewable energy powered world including for the Philippines is possible and the technologies to reach that world are available. However, the transition is not only a technical and an engineering endeavor. It is at best political, social. Policy should therefore be aligned with the trust of the transition. The same is true with financing and capacity development. Indeed, the education of our future generations has to be geared towards preparing and mitigating the risks of the climate crisis and other future emergent risks. Most importantly, we have to address the vulnerabilities of our people. The pandemic wipes out household incomes, ensuring that our vulnerable populations, and there are many of them in, in, our, in our society, the poorest amongst us, the people or persons with disabilities, our seniors, the LGBTs, the indigenous peoples, and many others, they should receive their necessary social and economic support to shield their livelihoods from the negative impacts, and this should be non-negotiable. Our vulnerable people have been suffering from climate impacts the most, including the lack of energy access, and we see them not only in remote off-grid islands in the Philippines, but even in urban Philippines. Elderly people also suffer from air pollution, their suffering could have been avoided if fossil fuel subsidies or um, to, to fossil fuel subsidies were instead used for uh, for health and for education. So we look forward into stimulus packages. We should demand jobs that are created in low carbon sectors. And this is not only in energy; it is also in transport. It is also in making our urban um, and our, our urban uh, places um, green and sustainable. Sustainable development for all can only be achieved if we take good care of those who have least in life, and these are the most vulnerable. And this is what I mean by just transition. You have to remember that Filipinos would not prioritize climate action if they do not benefit equitably from the subsequent recovery. Again, the key word here is benefit, and that has to be shared fairly and equitably across. If we are ever to provide subsidies, for example, to our airline industry, can we get them into the right track on sustainability, especially since public money will be spent to support them? First condition, if we ever have to do this, is that there should be no layoff. It is unacceptable for companies to get bailouts while laying off people, right? So in closing, a just transition to a large if not 100% renewable energy powered Philippines, is not only for engineers, not only for economists, not only for entrepreneurs, and not only for people in government. It requires a whole of society effort. Again, energy transition has a climate imperative, but at the same time, it has a sustainable development imperative. Enlisting everybody's contribution is a must to make that future happen. When this pandemic is over, every Filipino should have something magnificent to look forward to. And I guess, and I think, and I argue that energy transition is something that is magnificent.
and we look forward to it. Then after that, like Dante Alighieri, Alighieri we can le leave hell and again behold the stars. The future is in our hands. Let us move in the right direction. Madamo Gidnya Salama. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Dalina, for the very insightful keynote address. I believe our audience gained new knowledge and a new perspective on renewable energy and energy transition in the Philippines. So for the audience, please take note that you may submit your questions through the chat box here in Zoom and in Facebook, and we will try to address them during the Q&A portion later. And now, so to open our plenary discussion, I would like to introduce our moderator. So Attorney Rafael Lopilia is a current board member of the Ateneo Professional Schools. He served as Energy Secretary from 2005 to 2007. Attorney Lopilia has in-depth knowledge and experience in the energy, energy sector, as he also held senior positions in both government, agencies, and private companies in the Philippines, such as Power Sector Assets and Liabilities Management Corporation, Aboitis, Equity Ventures, is Exenor Incorporated, Petron Foundation, among others. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Attorney Rafael Lopilia. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Camille, can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. So, I, it, it is a pleasure on my part to warmly welcome all the participants to this uh, unassembled symposium. Thank you, Dr. Delina, for, for uh, your keynote speech. And we would like to welcome uh, Madam Vice President Tubredo to the forum as well. So there are a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, questions that have been raised already. But let us go first to the presenters. We have a distinguished uh, panel this morning. And the first speaker uh, is the Honorable Senator Sherwin Wynne Gachalian. Uh, he is the chairman of the Senate Committee on Energy in the 18th Congress. He is known for various pro-consumer legislation, such as Murang, Murang Corriente Act, Electric Cooperatives Emergency and Resiliency Act, Energy Virtual One-Stop Shop Act, the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, and Philippine Innovation Act. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I present uh, the Honorable Senator Gachalia. Senator, you have the floor. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Uh... Uh, Secretary Lutilia, good morning, Secretary Kusi, Secretary Singson, uh, Don uh, Dean Ron, and of course to our uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Delina, and uh, Father Jet, of course. Um, uh, uh, happy retirement, and you're leaving us uh, with a good planet uh, after uh, your advocacy on um, sustainable energy and climate change. But um, uh, let me just share my thoughts on um, uh, and my observation on the power sector during the pandemic. In fact, uh, Secretary Kusi and I, together with uh, Chair Devanadera and uh, Congressman Lord, has been in constant touch uh, discussing the effects of COVID to the power sector. And um, we wanted to assure the public that energy security and uh, constant supply of electricity uh, will not be an issue um, here in our country. And uh, looking at uh, what the pandemic uh, uh, created or what the pandemic, um, uh, uh, or the effects of pandemic in the power sector, uh, as we all know, it virtually reduced the demand of electricity in our country. And uh, later on, I think the Secretary will probably expound on that. But on the average in Luzon, uh, about 30% of demand uh, went down. In Visayas, about 19%, uh, largely because the Visayas is still uh, a residential, um, uh, the demand still comes from the residential. 
and uh, in Mindanao, it was reduced to about uh, 25%. Um, I observe that the reduction in the size is not so big because it's, it's you know, residential and islands. No? And, uh, but having said that, across the board, three islands, demand has gone down. Um, the effects of that was um, uh, quite unknown for most of us because the first thing that came to my mind is, how are we going to assure our consumers with constant supply of electricity, considering that there were a few um, resolutions, both from ERC and from DOE, to help out our consumers? So if you forego payment of electricity, uh, who will be the entity that will be left holding the bag? Uh, of course, as Secretary Singson will say it's the Gencos. But at the end of the day, it will, it will really be the banks who will be holding the bag. And, um, but uh, you know, the power sector is a very bankable sector. Um, and my analysis of the power sector, it's really a financing um, business because of its uh, nature, because of the feature of the contracts, which is completely passed through. It's basically investing now uh, to generate power, and you will be paid over time uh, throughout the life of your contract. So the pandemic basically uh, had negative effects in the system, but it's only temporary in nature. So meaning once the economy jump starts, um, the power plants will get paid, and in effect, the banks will get paid. So having said that, uh, the, the discussion uh, uh, with Secretary Pusi and the other stakeholders were let, let's, 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 let's let the market adjust by itself. Uh, let the banks um, uh, negotiate with their GENCOs and let the GENCOs negotiate with their banks and find a amicable solution so that the, the, the GENCOs can constantly supply electricity. Um, the, uh, directive from DOE to suspend payments all the way to the entire system really helped me because it's not only the Genco suspending payments to the banks, but the entire system had some form of reprieve. So that helped out uh, in terms of stability in the system. But having said that, I just observe also one thing that will, I think, um, somehow lay the case that flexibility is very important in times of pandemic. Because uh, as we all know, um, coal plants have a minimum threshold when it comes to capacity. And I think uh, Secretary Singson will expound on that later. Um, coal plants cannot ramp up and run down every day. The, the plants will, uh, will have a lot of problems in terms of uh, technical operation. So it has to maintain some form of capacity uh, in order to be economical, both financially and technically. And what we observe, because demand has gone down so much that it has reached a point that running the plants became very expensive and maintaining capacity has been very expensive. And let me just share a slide. I just want to share one slide with, with the body. This is a slide that we, we called uh, during the time of pandemic, and we looked at the marginal cost of running a coal plant versus the loaded weighted average price of WSM. And at some point, you can see the, the, the uh, marginal cost of running the plant, which is the red bar, has gone down um, uh, the loaded, the loaded average, weighted average price in West End. So in effect, it's more expensive to run your coal plant um, by using your marginal cost versus the amount you'll be paying. So um, I, I, we, we looked at this slide because there were requests from the coal plants to suspend uh, some of the, uh, to suspend the mass offer feature in West End. And it is precisely, they requested that because 
uh, it became more expensive for them to run their coal plants and it became more expensive for them to operate the coal plants because uh, uh, in the time of pandemic because, because demand has gone down uh, quite tremendously. So this leaves the case for flexibility. And um, let me just remove the slide. And I think what uh, the pandemic presented to us that flexibility is very important. And flexibility uh, in, in, in the system is very important. And that's how um, renewable energy came in. Um, uh, because the marginal cost of wind and solar is almost zero. Uh, it can actually supply electricity even uh, demand has gone down tremendously. Now, the next question is, will the pandemic change the behavior of our utilities? And this is something um, I don't think will happen anytime soon. Um, the utilities are, uh, are used to a certain type of behavior. For example, almost all utilities want a certainty on their base load. And they want to make sure that they supply electricity uh, in terms of base load to their consumers, no matter what. That's why most utilities will contract their base load. And because of our least cost um, uh, requirement, uh, coal plants normally will fill in that base load requirement. And um, uh, that's why, even though flexibility became a very important feature in the, in, during the pandemic, but a lot of the utilities think that the pandemic will be a temporary occurrence once the vaccine will come out. Um, the utilities will once again go back to their original behavior, which is we have to make sure that we have constant supply, supply of electricity for base load. Um, it's very challenging to change the behavior of our utilities because at the end of the day, it's the utilities that buy electricity. And one game changer that I can see, actually two game changers that I can see is, number one, if we allow financial contracts, uh, if ERC will change its, um, its uh, um, notion of contracts and allow financial contracts. Uh, we can see that in the Meralco, recent Meralco CSP, uh, although it's not formally in the TOR, but we, have, we see a lot of mix resources in their contracts. If we allow, if ERC will allow, for example, a Genco that can package, let's say, gas and then solar or wind, and then just look at the price, regardless of where you buy your electricity, but look at the price and allow financial contracts to be, uh, to be uh, supplied to, to the consumers. That's one of the game changers that we uh, can see um, to allow more renewable energy in the system. And then another one uh, is storage. Um, and storage, uh, the price of storage is going down dramatically over the past few years. But I looked at the uh, BNF, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance numbers, and I saw that uh, storage uh, is still quite expensive compared to, uh, let's say, a coal-fired power plant, especially uh, if the coal-fired power plant is quite old already. So um, uh, storage is one technology that we need to watch closely. I believe it will go down sooner than, uh, than we think because China is going in to storage in, in a very big way. And anything that China goes in in a very big way, the prices will come down. But we have to keep an eye on uh, storage because once that hits our shores, then it gives the a variable RE, a fighting chance to compete with um, uh, traditional coal-fired or even gas-fired power plants. I say this because, again, for the utilities to change its behavior, uh, it has to make sure that uh, base load is supplied constantly. And if you have storage and variable RE combined, then in effect, that can supply base load to the utilities. So they won't look at whether it's coal-fired or, or gas, but since storage combined with RE can deliver 24-7 power at base load capacity, 
then the utilities will utilities will be open and looking at that. But I think an immediate uh, game changer would be that financial contracts. No? And uh, right now, ERC only allows one is to one contract. Meaning, if you want one plant, the contract should represent that one plant. But if um, ERC will change its uh, dimension and allow financial contracts, I think we can see variable RE, at least variable RE, come into the system uh, quite fast. Um, of course, we have the renewable portfolio, portfolio standards that's coming into play. Uh, that is a lot of help. Uh, I think the uh, Secretary Kusi will, will probably talk about them. But again, uh, what the pandemic presented to all of us is flexibility is very important. And uh, flexibility uh, um, uh, uh, will help our consumers uh, not only uh, not only um, uh, deliver constant electricity to their homes, but also flexibility can reduce pricing because as we all know, a lot of the utilities have contracted capacities with coal fire partners. Uh, and to just end, the, one of the things that I also observe uh, that needs to be enhanced is in the demand side. As we all know, if you live in the Philippines, you probably encountered what we call a bill, a bill shock because uh, during March, April, and May, they only estimated our bills in July, uh, June, they reconciled everything. So a lot of our consumers um, uh, experience bill shock, whether it's May or June, but definitely June, will, you will experience that. And one of the technologies that we have to uh, hasten is the use of smart meters. And this is in the supplies, in the demand side. Um, during the pandemic, our meter readers cannot go to your homes and read the meters. Uh, if we have smart meters, uh, installed all over the country, then uh, we can read the meters even by remote. Uh, we can compute by month because right now you cannot compute by month because it, it goes around. You know, when it, go, it starts going around, you don't know when it's May, when it's, uh, when it's April, and when it's, it's March. But with the uh, smart meters, you will definitely know how much you consume each month and you can read it uh, remotely. And smart meters is also a very important technology to solar rooftops because it can, uh, it can, can uh, read the meter uh, uh, bilaterally. So those are the things that I observed during the pandemic and uh, some of the opportunities that we can uh, use to uh, uh, hasten the deployment of renewable energy in our country. That's really challenging because you also are changing behaviors. And uh, behavior of the utility firms, electric co-ops, private utilities, it's not easy to change because they're used to uh, things for, for decades and even for many, many years. But uh, definitely it's a starting point because they've seen that um, it, during the pandemic, flexibility is a very important feature that we need to have in our utilities. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for giving me, the, giving me the opportunity to share my observations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Gatchalian, for sharing your perspectives on how we can build back more sustainably. I think uh, you uh, pointed out a number of lessons there that we can uh, have an opportunity to discuss later in the Q&A. May I now call on uh, Mr. Rogelio Singson, who is the president and CEO of Meralco Powered Power Gen. Mr. Singson served as the Secretary of Public Works and Highways from 2010 to 2016. He also served as Director of Metro Pacific Investments Corporation and various private corporations in the Philippines. He was a board member at Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority, Metropolitan Waterworks and Sewerage System, and the National Power Corporation. Mr. Secretary Singson, please. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Secretary Popo. Uh, first of all, allow me to greet uh, Madam uh, Vice President Lenny Robredo. Of course, uh, our colleagues in the panels, Senator Sherwin Gachalian, Secretary Al Kusi, uh, of course, Father Jet, good morning to you. 
uh, Dean Mendoza and uh, Dr. Delina. Uh, again, to everyone, good morning, and thank you for uh, this opportunity to share my views on the energy and sustainable development uh, issues. Uh, let me mention that uh, relatively, I'm a newbie to the energy sector, okay? So I keep an open mind about all of these things. Uh, but let me just uh, follow up what uh, was originally mentioned that although, although we have seen a 25 to 30% drop in electricity, as far as Meralco is concerned, we still are forecasting an, a 4% average growth for the period 2021 to 2020, 2030. So we are confident that there will still be a growth in, uh, in demand. Now, the second, I, second point I'd like to uh, mention is Meralco as the biggest uh, distribution entity has already adopted and put in place what we've been talking about, the energy transition plan. And we have adopted that already in our business starting 2021, which includes uh, sustainability reporting, as well as deliberately increasing our RE sources from the current, let me again repeat, from the current of 30% renewable to us uh, 50%. So that's already in the sustainability plan of Meralco. Now, my role, our role as uh, Meralco, precisely to provide uh, that transition from current uh, sources to a more renewable energy. So let me just mention that during the first quarter prior to the pandemic, LNG supplied 39% of Meralco's fuel mix. Coal was 30%, and multi-fuel, this includes uh, at about 31%, and solar, unfortunately, was at a low 1%. So we'd like, as I said, do a transition to increase renewable to as high as 50% of Meralco sources. Now, I'd like to commend the, the Department of Energy, led by Secretary Al Kusi, because our biggest problem, our biggest constraint, I think this was mentioned earlier, is the availability of infrastructure. We all agree, I think uh, we all agree that there is sufficient renewable energy sources globally. But the issue is how do you bring or how do you transmit that to the load centers? There's even, I know a, a, a UN sponsored organization uh, AIDCO, Global Energy Interconnection Development uh, Organization. And uh, they really want to be able to develop the technology to move uh, renewable energy sources across continents. So admittedly, even in the Philippines, we have sufficient renewable energy, but the issue is how do you bring these renewable energy sources to the load centers? So there is an infrastructure constraint. And that's why, as I was mentioning, the DOE has come up with renewable energy zones in its development plan so that uh, they have identified areas in the Philippines where there are sufficient and renewable energy sources, whether it's wind, solar, hydro, and so on, that you need to bring them to the load centers. Now, that requires infrastructure investments. Now, so that to me is a major constraint. How will that be addressed to be able to bring available renewable energy sources to the load centers? Now, the other point I'd like to mention is, uh, I personally and we in MGen have adopted Laudato Si principles. This is the papal encyclical on environment. Now, so in the next five to seven years, uh, as far as MGen is concerned, we will endeavor to generate 50% of our pipeline of projects from renewable. This could be in solar, floating solar, wind, et cetera. Now, uh, which means that we have to make sure that the energy transition is just. The Laudato principle says, 
the primary responsibility of developing countries is its social development and poverty alleviation. So that is very clear, especially after the pandemic. Let's not even talk of uh, economic growth. Let's just try to uh, restore where we were in 2019. Let's not even talk of uh, creating jobs. Let's just restore the jobs that was lost because of the pandemic. Now, so as far as the energy transition, it is maintaining and making sure that our primary objective is really social development and poverty allevi alleviation and creating jobs. Now, I read in the I, I, uh, in uh, IEA report that a big chunk of the coal projects that are planned for the period 2020 and forward, a big portion of that is still going to be developed developed coming from highly industrialized countries. Now, who created the climate change in the first place? It is not the developing countries, it is the industrialized countries. So they have to take on the primary responsibility of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It is the responsibility of the highly industrialized countries who created the problem in the first place. Our primary responsibility as a developing country is our social development and poverty alleviation. As I said earlier, as energy sources is already 30% from uh, multifuels, including renewables, hydro and uh, geothermal. Uh, other industrialized countries are just wishfully thinking that in five years or 10 years, they will have as much as 10 to 15% from renewables. Okay. So uh, I'm saying, let's do a just energy transition. That, that to me is important. Now, uh, the other concern here is because of social development and creation of jobs, the, po the government policy is still lowest cost of electricity. You know? So then you, that's where you, you balance in. Now, I wish, I started looking at uh, renewable sources, particularly solar. Unfortunately, you encounter issues with farmers. Everybody wants flat land. Uh, one megawatt of, you need how many hectares? Now, so the issue is, do you sacrifice food production for solar? So these are the things that, uh, that has to be properly balanced. Now, uh, if you look into uh, new technologies, let's, let's tackle coal, because as uh, Senator Gachalian mentioned, uh, it looks like uh, coal will still be the lowest uh, cost of energy uh, source. Now, there are new technologies, which we call supercritical, that reduces carbon gas emission by 30 or as much as 50% if you go to ultra supercritical. Now, uh, we are trying to develop a 1,200 megawatt coal plant using sup ultra supercritical. We are only using a footprint of less than 50 hectares. If you want to do that in solar, you need at least 1,200 hectares of farmlands. So you can imagine the displacement in terms of food production versus. So as I said, this has to be uh, re uh, looked into very seriously because it will also impact on uh, the food production side of our country. Now, uh, let me just assure everyone that yes, we are very serious. We want to move from the current energy sources and increase penetration of renewable energies in the country. But we need to address the constraints of uh, uh, transmission capacity, bringing energy sources to the load centers. And second, we have to make sure that we address the issue of uh, low cost of electricity. As then third is how do we address the impact on farmlands? Okay, so 
I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think uh, we can have uh, a discussion after. So thank you so much, uh, Attorney Popo. Thank you, Secretary Singson, and uh, for emphasizing uh, sustainable development goal number one, which is the elimination of poverty as, our, uh, as an important consideration in our uh, energy agenda. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker or panelist is the Honorable Secretary Alfonso Cusi, who is, uh, of course, everybody knows is the Secretary of Energy of the Philippines. He has more than four decades of leadership experience in both private and public sectors. And he was entrusted by President Duterte to fast track the development of renewable energy sources and reduce dependence on uh, traditional uh, fossil fuels. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Kusi. Hi, uh, good morning to our host, uh, Atene the Ateneo uh, School of Government and uh, ASAP and Cells. And uh, of course, uh, Senator uh, Winga Chalian and uh, to former Secretary Babes uh, and uh, our moderator, Sek uh, Popo, uh, Father uh, Jet uh, Vigerin, uh, Doctor, uh, Dr. Luke Delina, and, uh, and to the two others you know, uh, present and um, those listeners. Of course, I, I, I heard that uh, Vice President uh, Rubredo is with us. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Um, you know, at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, I have been uh, talking to my teams uh, every day that I, I will meet with them and say that, you know, uh, this pandemic, uh, this coronavirus uh, 19 uh, brought both uh, problems and opportunities. So I said to them that, uh, you know, as uh, wor government workers and even to the entrepreneurs, what do we look at? Do we fixate on problems or do we look at the opportunities? And I think, of course, uh, we need to uh, take care of addressing the, uh, the disease and uh, keep ourselves uh, safe and healthy. Uh, but uh, we should be looking at the really at the opportunities what we can do, not only in the energy industry, but uh, overall, you know, in, a, in, a, a, in our way of life. And uh, we must really innovate. It calls for more innovation. So that's what I have been saying to, uh, to my team and the challenge that I posed to them. Of course, I listened uh, to the earlier uh, speakers and uh, the latest is uh, former Secretary Babes, where he said that uh, you know, they're trying to get that 50% from uh, renewable and the solar. Actually, the government, uh, that we in the government, we have been working closely with the Department of Agriculture on the nexus of water, uh, food, and energy. And uh, it was mentioned that, uh, you know, on the uh, solar competing with food production, that is a real concern. Uh, some of the uh, uh, agricultural land has been converted uh, to produce uh, electricity using solar. And uh, now what we are trying is uh, solar on top of water, the dam, the hydro dam that we have, uh, we are we're using it now for trials for uh, uh, solar and uh, also putting the food production for fish, uh, fishery. So uh, closely working with the Department of Agriculture along that line, uh, that was, uh, you know, the, we discussed this during our IATF uh, meeting on uh, food security. Anyway, our topic here is about energy. And uh, actually I prepared uh, a paper that I'd like to deliver with to you. So instead of, of being lost, you know, and the fear of being lost and talking too much, I would stick and try to read uh, uh, at, uh, the paper that I prepare, okay? So of course, it's uh, really a pleasure to be with all of you. And um, it's an honor, it's a timely discussion that uh, we are going, well, that we are having, we are having here. And uh, for us to share our views on how the Philippine energy sector could rise above the challenges and maximize opportunities 
uh, brought about by the coronavirus disease 2019 pandemic. I would like to present my compliments to Dr. Delina uh, for your very uh, provoking uh, keynote of 100% uh, uh, Philippine renewable uh, by uh, 2050. Uh, truly attaining a secure and a sustainable energy future calls for innovative, innovative thinking, as well as the full and enthusiastic participation of all sectors of society. But before I go any farther, allow me to say that I'm not and never been against renewable energy. Having adopted technology neutral policy, the very cornerstone of my policy direction caters for all possible energy solution without prejudice to or predisposition against any particular resource. Why, you might ask? Because our energy situation is very much different from other countries. We, we, are, we have the inadequate supply. We need to build up our capacity and we need it now. And for those of us involved in policy and decision making, we must strike a balance between meeting our current energy needs and building a better world for the coming generations. From where we are at right now, we cannot sacrifice one in favor of the other. Wish it could be that simple, but we all know that energy sector is complex. From the exploration stage up to the development of energy resources, there are really no easy solutions. There are only hard and tough policy challenges of both threats and opportunities. And we focus on opportunities even in this time of pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic shook the globe to its very core. All major industries were disrupted one way or the other. Throughout the pandemic, we have been conscious of the importance of energy that was mentioned by uh, Se uh, Senator Gachalian that uh, even at the height of uh, this pandemic during the ECQ, we were meeting virtually to make sure and to assure uh, that we have enough, enough power. So we have been making sure that sufficient energy is available for all. Members of the energy family immediately went into overdrive to assume what we call our backliner. I will call, uh, I, I, I'm calling, I mean I, I mean, I called our industry, the energy industry players from the generation, transmissions, distributions as backliners. No? Role providing of energy services for the continued operations of our hospitals, which cared for the sick. We made sure that there is power in the house, in the homes. You know, just imagine if there were no electricity during the pandemic, you know, and they stay home policy. You know, you can, you can just imagine that. So we assured that there will be no interruption or at the, at the minimum, wala sanang maging brownout. In addition, we asked our attached agencies as well as industry players to submit their respective business continuity plans. So pag start pa lang po, March 3, we had our, uh, we had our um, cabinet meeting and uh, we were discussing this problem, uh, the coronavirus. And uh, we were afraid that our people in the industry, the energy sector might be infected or contaminated. We have to make sure that our plants, that both generation, transmission and distribution would be running. So we require them to submit to us their uh, business continuity program, considering the different scenarios. So this business continuity plans are regularly, are regularly reviewed and updated and now include measures as we transition into the new normal. The energy industry persevered despite limited movement and threats to the personal health and safety of energy personnel. And now that we are slowly easing up restrictions to jumpstart our economy, we are strictly enforcing our COVID-19 response protocol for energy sector. 
as well as the Department of Energy's Public Service Continuity Plan to uphold the occupational health and safety of our people. While we see, we see to it that enough energy supply is available when needed. I only have gratitude and deep appreciation for the industry players, from the generation to transmission to distribution, for the hard work and dedication of the DOE family and the, who risk their lives just to ensure expeditious and unhampered delivery of energy goods and services in time of pandemic. I fully support the development and utilization of our renewable resources, but without sacrificing the achievement of our energy security. Our main takeaway from the COVID-19 crisis for the energy industry is the importance of energy security. The pandemic revealed the vulnerability of energy systems. It could be interrupted this is why the UE is looking at developing all possible energy sources, including nuclear, to help the Philippines become energy sec secure. Towards this end, we are further boosting development of our indigenous energy resources. And our country is blessed with abundant sources of renewable energy. This include biomass, solar, hydro, ocean, wind and geothermal power. With this wealth before us, it shouldn't come as a surprise that our country continues to have the highest renewable energy generation mix within the ASEAN region. Based on the latest statistics we have in 2019, renewable energy accounted for 33% of the Philippines total primary supply. We are 10% ahead vis-a-vis -vis the regional target set forth in the ASEAN Plan of Action on Energy Cooperation, which seeks, seeks to increase the RE component of the ASEAN total primary energy mix to 23% by 2025. As of now, we are already at 33%. We at the DOE are fully committed to the implementation of Republic Act 9513 or the Philippine Renewable Energy Act of 2008. In fact, on the indigenous energy resource development front, since 2016, we have awarded a total of 472 renewable energy service contracts with a potential capacity of 20 gigawatts. This, must, this may translate to an additional 8% renewable energy share to our total primary energy supply. This, higher than our, this is higher than our indicative and committed coal plants for the same period, which only has a potential capacity of 14.5 gigawatts. But among the array of our vast renewable energy resources, I believe it is best to focus on the resources that are readily available and extend all the necessary support to encourage its development. We need to maximize geothermal and hydro energy utilization as they have proven their reliability as base load power resources, sources, crucial for our commercial and industrial needs. RA 9513 provides additional incentives for geothermal advancement. In addition to those, it prescribes for other RE resource development. Thus, investors need only to be encouraged to consider geothermal energy development from among their top choices. For this reason, a few days ago, I have asked my team to prepare a formal DOE order on initiatives and guidelines that would promote geothermal energy. I'm also coordinating with our PESA for the development of an economic zone that would provide clean energy to the locators. 
I have a little problem with this because in every international uh, discussion that I'm that I've had, I have been in inviting those advocate those ad who advocates clean energy manufacturers to locate in the Philippines. But our problem is that, as uh, former Secretary Babes mentioned, it is the price, the affordability. So we really need to have that balance. But we are working now for a, a clean energy manufacturing economic zone. And that is will be based on providing uh, geothermal, both electricity and the heat. The heat. Our renewable energy was enacted in 2008. However, even I was surprised when I assumed office as energy secretary to have learned that a couple of its policy mechanism provisions have yet to be realized. Hence, we immediately went to work and have gotten the ball rolling. First, the renewable, renewable portfolio standards. A supply side policy which mandates distribution utilities to source a minimum portion of energy from the renewable sources. This I would like to thank uh, Yusek Wimpy Fuentebella, you know, who really helped me in uh, developing this uh, policy. So, and second, the green energy option program, which empowers consumers to insist that the energy they consume is sourced from renewable resources. This is where we have a problem again, because those who advocate uh, clean energy and be sourcing it from RE, uh, also you know, try to shy away from it, ex exercising that option because of the cost. So, and second is the energy option program, which empower, uh, sorry, you are also to determine to establish a green energy auction program with an initial of 200 megawatts, which would, would augment RE capacity in the grid. This pricing program will support RE generators in securing power supply agreements and selling their energy through the establishment of a fair by baseline price. So this green energy pricing option, uh, we allocated 2000 megawatts purely for uh, renewable energy. This in lieu of fit, we shied away from fit because fit tend to pull the price up. When we want renewable, it is pulling our, uh, our electricity price up. And that is becoming, uh, it, it, uh, it, 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 uh, it makes Philippines uncompetitive to attract manufacturers. So uh, we, we are adopting this, uh, green energy uh, auction program uh, that would somewhat uh, price the uh, uh, renewable energy at the avoided cost. The avoided cost somewhere, it is the average uh, price that uh, we are paying. Having recognized the value of available uh, RE resources, the DOE is looking at other mechanisms where electricity and juicers can share the re re renewable energy generation during short supply shortfall, shortfalls, as well as further enhancement of existing net metering arrangement. As of now, out of the 2.9 million households, there are only 3,100 households with rooftop solar with a capacity of around 28 megawatts. So, this is where we should really focus on increasing our renewable, uh, I mean, especially solar, solar. If we can just top 10% of the household to produce uh, electricity from um, solar rooftop, it will really boost, uh, uh, boost the share of uh, solar. In conclusion, going back to our technology neutral policy, we have adapt, adapted it to enable our country, our country, like ours, to build power capacity, including the deployment of both intermittent and dispatchable generation without sacrificing progress in our renewable energy landscape. 
we must all work together to make the Philippines energy self-sufficient. We cannot be at the mercy of global market volatilities, geopolitical movement, or pandemics. This pandemic will not be the last. So we really have to be prepared. Even before the COVID-19 crisis, our tight power supplies and high electricity prices have worked against our country. They have kept, kept foreign investors away, dampening prospects to further expedite economic progress. We have to do something to attract these foreign investors and choose the Philippines as our Philippines over our other competitors. We must promote the Philippines as an energy investment destination to help generate jobs and propel the country towards social economic development. It was reported by NEDA in our uh, one of our IATF meeting that uh, power industry uh, registered a positive uh, growth during the first quarter, and it, it is seen, you know, as also by investors as a safe um, industry to invest in, at least in our country. One core challenge, however, is that our pursuit of the common good, there are times where in, we unintentionally overlook the most of us in, posi in, a pos in positions of influence also come from varying degrees and kinds of privilege. If I left, if, at, if left unchecked, this has the potential to leave our judgment dangerously skewed. To give an example, we are pleased that our country has been making strides in institutionalizing energy efficiency and conservation and conver conservation and transforming it into a national way of life. Yes, energy efficiency and cons cons conservation is the way of the future. It is now at the forefront of fields such as engineering, construction, and architecture. But are we still able to step back and take a look at how EE and C plays into the daily lives of average Filipinos, many of whom have lost their job due to the pandemic and are struggling to make ends meet. The minimum wattage for average lighting is about 50 watts. A 50 watt incandescent light bulb costs 58 pesos, while it, its LED bulb equivalent of 13 watts costs almost double at around 112 pesos. Of course, all of us here know the merits of LED technology as the longer lasting and more energy efficient bulb. At the same time, we also know that lead bulbs are the most expensive. But for someone who may, whose main objective is to light up his home, which option do we think will he go for? The average one will most probably forego the long-term advantages of investing in a lead bulb, thinking that the 50 pesos he saved from buying an incandescent bulb would be better allocated for a kilogram or so of rice, an additional liter of fuel for his tricycle or for his pamasahe for work. Again, such truths leave us standing at the crossroad of crafting forward looking policies that remain in touch with our current realities. We need to ensure that there is no disconnect between the two we must be able to effectively address the primary needs of our people, most especially in this global new, formal, no, new normal. At the start of my statement, I stress, stress the importance of striking a balance between meeting our current need for reliable, secure, and affordable energy and building a cleaner and better world for the coming generation. Before I end, I pose this question for all of us to ponder. In attaining energy secu security, do we find a win-win solution that will be acceptable to all the concerned sectors? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a challenge before us. Surely there is no other way but to collaborate and find the answers. And I believe that with all sectors fully on board, we will overcome the worst 
with the best yet to come. On a personal note, before I turn over the airtime to our next speaker, I really hope that you all felt somehow safe and secure during this prolonged lockdown. Thank you very much and good morning to all. Thank you very much, Secretary Kusi, for outlining the sustainable energy development plans and, and priorities of government. Uh, I like your use of the word backliner because one hears about energy only when there is a problem. So if there is no problem or one doesn't hear about the energy people, then that means we're doing okay. Uh, can we now uh, go to the uh, uh, open forum or discussion? I wish we could have a more interactive uh, uh, what is this exchange, but uh, we are limited by uh, circumstances. So let me ask uh, Dr. Delina, uh, first of all, this question is uh, addressed to you. Since uh, everyone will play an important role in making the transition to clean energy possible, how can we further engage the public and the communities in incorporating clean renewable energy practices in their daily lives, especially after the pandemic. Perhaps you can cite uh, observations on how other neighboring Asian countries, if any, engage their communities on the energy transition. Dr. Delina. So the Thank you, Dr. Lutelia. Yeah, um, so, so public engagement is one of the key strands of my ongoing research as well on just energy transition. Um, I, I am of the opinion that community energy should be part and parcel of the energy transition, uh, especially if you factor in justice, equity, and fairness on it. Uh, we have plenty of uh, community energy um, Examples actually in the Philippines, a small scale of grid islands, for example, uh, one, um, one thing that comes to mind is the story of Romblon Electric Cooperative, who is a very, is doing a lot of things to transition the way uh, they generate and use energy in, in Romblon Islands. I've also been doing a lot of research in, in Thailand on community energy and seeing how uh, ordinary Thais or ordinary citizens are actually contributing to the energy transition agenda. Um, so supporting, providing support. So in terms of financing, in terms of capacity building is, is important in this regard. So we do not just necessarily need to train uh, uh, skilled installers, rooftop solar, home systems installers, but we also need to educate and, and empower our ordinary uh, consumer who will now become prosumers in, in, in the energy transition um, uh, future. Um, ordinary citizens have, have an important role to play in, in, in the energy transition agenda in the Philippines. Uh, Secretary Kusi has mentioned about energy efficiency and conservation uh, in, in his, uh, in his uh, intervention. Uh, I'm also of the opinion that uh, ordinary citizens can, can really look at uh, demand side management as well. So looking at not only the way they can transition their, their, their technologies, but also the, the, their behaviors itself, like switching off uh, lights when they're not used, the switching off computers when they're not used, um, making sure that we plug out our, our, our mobile phones when, when, when the battery is fully charged. Those are very simple mundane kind of, of, of efforts that ordinary Filipinos can can, can, can do in order to participate in this um, in this movement for for just transition in in the Philippines, and of course there are plenty others. Thank you very much uh, for for uh, those who have uh, heard about the and about the uh, stimulus packages. The question to Senator Gatchalian and the, related also to Secretary Kusi is. Would the COVID-19 pandemic prompt Congress to include energy, effic energy efficiency measures and others in relating to power and energy in the stimulus package? The, uh, uh, the IEA claims that such measures have a significant employment effect. So to Secretary Kusi is if uh, 
energy or power is going to be included, what are those that you would like to see uh, in those uh, included in the stimulus package for the power sector? Well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Saka Popo. Uh, that was uh, really uh, discussed. Uh, the, what are the stimulus that, is, that are needed by the uh, industry, by the energy industry? First, uh, you, we all know that uh, uh, energy is, uh, everything is at the hands of uh, the private uh, sector. And uh, that is another issue that I have been debating that uh, for uh, basic uh, basic uh, services like power, should it be really given 100% the private sector? But that's water under the bridge, but just on the learning. Now, what are the stimulus that are needed? I believe that uh, we have the Malampaya, uh, we have the Malampaya fund. Uh, and uh, we've been saying that we should use this. Uh, we, uh, we, 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 should, we, use, we should use this in uh, developing our uh, geothermal, uh, not just on the, uh, the exploration for energy development. And uh, that fund, uh, if used, uh, will greatly support in the uh, achieving energy security for the country. But we all know that, uh, that malam, part of that Malampaya fund, based on the, laws that, uh, the law that has been uh, uh, recently or last year approved, you know, based on the bill that was filed by Senator Gachalian, uh, using it to uh, uh, pay for the, uh, the stranded, uh, the stranded uh, cost, or the, the UCME, you know, the part stranded debts, and, uh, to, bring the, uh, to bring the cost of uh, the energy. So I would look at uh, really using the Malampaya, Malampaya fund for uh, uh, to entice development uh, in the energy uh, industry. Thank you, uh, Senator Gatsalian. You might want to address that question. And there's Thank actually you. a related question while you're on the microphone, which is, can you please elaborate how financial contracts will be a game changer in CSPs? Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Sir Popo. Uh, no, stimulus has been a buzzword now no? yeah, during the pandemic. In fact, uh, uh, when you follow COVID-19, uh, the buzzwords will be testing, contact tracing, and the other one will be stimulus. And um, uh, in our country, the stimulus packages have been very, very controversial to a large extent because um, it has to be the money that will be put in as a form of stimulus should be very well studied and it should be efficiently used. Um, we don't have unlimited resources and we don't have unlimited funds. And the little funds that we have should, make, should be used to make sure that it's efficient and it's targeted. So having said that, um, I just to answer your question directly, there is no stimulus package per se to the energy sector and to the power sector. What happened, as I mentioned earlier, is the market was left to correct by itself. And the correction came in when the Banco Central injected close to a trillion, almost a trillion, 1.2 trillion cash into the banking system. That in effect somehow stabilized the banking system and also stabilized in effect the power sector. So I know for a fact there is a lot of companies now doing bilateral negotiations in their loans because typical gearing will be probably around 40 to 60 percent so they're negotiating so that contributed to the stability of the power sector what the power sector received from government is more of a reprieve our consumers got a reprieve in terms of paying their bills uh, erc promulgated uh, a new resolution uh, giving four months, you can pay your bills in four months if you consume 200 kilowatt hour and below. And if you consume above that, 
uh, sorry, if you consume 200 kilowatt and below, you're given six months. If you consume above that, you're given four months. So that, in effect, was the reprieve that was given to our consumers. Um, but what also, and I have to comment DOE, uh, the resolution that they came out with, uh, because they already foresaw some instability in the system. So they released a resolution or a, a memorandum order that will give reprieve along the value chain or along the ecosystem. So for example, I'm in the transmission sector, I'm giving a, a reprieve on that. If I'm in the generation sector, I'm also given a reprieve on paying my suppliers. So that in effect created stability in the system. So um, again, there's no stimulus per se, but there's a reprieve in the initial point of the power sector, which is from the consumers. And, and, and to discuss about the financial contracts, and, um, I think the financial contracts can be structured wherein uh, you look at only the price and you look at the capacity or the energy to be delivered. So for example, if a utility will uh, undertake CSP and it will require, let's say, a uh, 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 thousand megawatts for the next maybe five years or even 10 years. You just look at how much uh, the price that GenCos can deliver and the capacity that, that can, they can guarantee. Uh, but the GenCos will be allowed to mix and match their resources. For example, if my neighboring, if I have a neighbor who can generate solar, and if I have a neighbor who can generate wind at night, maybe I can maybe I can package solar in the morning, wind at night, and then some some uh, fossil fuel in the middle when there is no wind. But my 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 deliverable is I will deliver to you a thousand megawatt at this price, regardless of uh, what type of source of energy it will be coming from. Uh, right now, uh, it's a one-is-one -one contract that ERC looks at. For example, if my contract is coal, it's only, it has to be coal lang. But uh, we have to give flexibility to the Genco so they can package. And this opens up some opportunities for variable RE because we all know variable RE happens during the day or happens during the night. So that opens up some opportunities uh, for variable RE to come into the system. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator, for that explanation. Uh, the, we have run out of time, but uh, I don't know if the organizers can give our, uh, our speaker and panelists uh, a, uh, a few sentences to conclude. Uh, Camille, is that OK? Yes, sir. OK. So uh, may I ask, therefore, Dr. Delina to uh, make uh, some concluding remarks and then I will, I will ask the others as well. Please. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Secretary Tia. Um, so just to conclude again, I have to, 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 to mention here um, energy reliability, uh, energy flexibility, as, as, as Senator Wynne has mentioned, uh, Secretary Kusis earlier mentioned about energy security. So these are actually all in tandem. So energy security, energy flexibility, energy resiliency, as I had mentioned, uh, energy independence. Um, but we have always to factor in the context of justice, fairness, and equity, especially in light of the ongoing crisis, the ongoing emergency, the climate emergency. Um, I, uh, it's, it's now clear that I am for 100% renewable energy Philippines, and I'm very happy to, um, to, to, to note that the, the Department of Energy are actually pushing very hard to, to, to make the uh, provisions of the renewable energy law in 2008 is now 12 years old uh, into reality. So, so it's a really welcome, uh, it's a welcoming note to, 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 to mention that, that they are considering RPS, um, the auctions and, 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 and prosumership and, and, and others. 
uh, but we always have to think about uh, the ordinary Filipinos. So um, electricity generation is, is a costly endeavor and we have to make sure that um, you know, um, it, it, the, the cost is not, uh, it's not a burden to, 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 the, to the most vulnerable. So I'm speaking here of, of our indigenous peoples, of our uh, unemployed, uh, unemployed citizens, uh, the elderly, the LGBTIs, and, and, and the other vulnerable sectors of the society. Again, I, have, I will close this uh, intervention by mentioning um, that, you know, uh, and, and Secretary Cruz has mentioned this already, this will not be our final pan pandemic. Um, the climate crisis will actually open up plenty of other public health issues in, in, in the years to come. So we're better prepared, we better uh, ensure that our energy systems are secured, our energy systems are flexible, our energy systems are reliable, uh, resilient, and, and, and at the same time that we embed in the concept of justice and, and, and fairness as we go along. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Delina. Uh, Secretary Singson? Babes? Thank you, Popo. Uh, my closing statement is I fully support uh, all the discussions on pushing for more renewable, but keep in mind that we have to really think about the, the social justice you know, or social development and employment uh, opportunities, job creation that uh, our country needs most at this time now. So we really have to be, we really have to go through an energy transition plan that makes sense. And that addresses precisely this current concerns under this new norm. Uh, we've lost a lot of jobs. We uh, have to look at how much time do we really need to be able to recover our growth pattern that we had experienced uh, the last decade. And uh, of course, we have to also consider the government's need to precisely address the pandemic. You know? So uh, let's not crowd the market uh, uh, and put all our eggs into one, one basket, but really have to uh, make it sure that uh, the energy transition also makes sense. So. I think we are very supportive of the move from fossil fuels to renewable energy, reducing carbon gas emission, but there are other priorities, especially at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Secretary Babes. We will send the questions for you as well, which we couldn't, which we couldn't uh, uh, address here. Yes, please. Yeah. Senator Sherwin. Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Popo. Uh, before I uh, give my closing remarks, let me greet uh, Vice President Lenny, uh, who's uh, here with us. Um, but my, my default vision is 100% sustainable energy, not only for the country, but for the whole world. I think that's the default, default vision for everyone. But uh, as we all know, energy is a great balancing act. I know Secretary Popo knows this very well, that you're balancing between energy security, energy sustainability, and savings, delivering cost-efficient systems to our consumers, especially in the developing nation like ours. That's why when we have hearings and we talk to stakeholders, you really see the tug of war between the consumer groups, between the environmentalist groups, and between uh, people who advocate um, indigenous energy and sustainable energy. You see the tug of war there. But what is what is what good thing? What what is what the beauty about what's happening in our country is um, we are keeping our eyes on the ball on all these things: security, sustainability, and savings. And um, I, I thank Ateneo for, and Father Jeff uh, for having forums like this because then we hear the arguments and we hear people advocating uh, for their own advocacy and their logic for advocating that. That creates the balancing act a much more holistic and inclusive um, activity uh, because we don't want to look at just pricing alone. We don't want to look at just sustainability alone. We don't want to look at just security alone. We have to look at the entire 
concept and balance it very well. Uh, it's a transition, definitely, like what Dr. Delina said. The transition may take 10 years, 50 years, but it's good to help have, have this discussion because this discussion uh, not only enlightens us, not only educates us, but also under, makes us understand the logic behind this advocacy. So thank you very much, Marjet and Ateneo, for hosting this. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Secretary Kusi, please. Secretary Kusi, you're on mute. Uh, thank you again, uh, Sec Popo. And uh, we all know that this pandemic will bring a lot of realignment on how business will be conducted. And the uh, primary importance, again, is uh, power, energy. And uh, for the Philippines, we've seen that uh, issues like uh, the high uh, population density of our urban area is a concern in uh, really controlling uh, the pandemic. And that's why we have this program of uh, really attracting people uh, to go back uh, to the provinces. We are an archipelago as, an, as a country, that's more than 7,000 islands. And uh, we have been developing our power in the um, NCR, the capital, and the uh, other urban cities. Uh, but there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things to be desired in our uh, island provinces. Uh, we all know that uh, they are still using uh, diesel as a source of power. We have been transitioning to go hybrid. Uh, it was uh, uh, cited by uh, Dr. Delina, the, the Rumblon. We have some models uh, that we have done hybrid and uh, we are addressing uh, some problems and it's still not inviting development. We would like to transition our island provinces to cleaner fuel and uh, we are now using, encouraging the use of gas. And this is the policy that uh, uh, we are adopting to identifying the provinces that we need to really transition now. We have to graduate uh, from uh, the household uh, electrification thinking, you know, a policy uh, to achieving a commercial or industrial grade of electricity in our provinces to encourage development uh, in those areas. That's the only way that we are going to have uh, economic uh, development in the area. And uh, we all are aware that electricity or these infrastructures has to become ahead uh, of the development before business would, uh, uh, would uh, pour in to the, uh, to the provinces. So these are the things that we are doing and uh, the policy, our policy, we will stick to our policy uh, based on our uh, the Philippine stat, uh, conditions, the landscape that we have. We need adequate capacity. And as I've mentioned this, even in the international forum that I have attended, I don't care where it comes from as long as I can you know, uh, provide the capacity. From there, it's, we are not sacrificing environment, we are transitioning, we are conscious, but uh, primary is adequate capacity for our country so that we can progress, so that we can attract investments. And only through manufacturing and the investments that we pour into the country that we can provide real employment, real growth, and real progress for our people. Because as we continue to have block of electricity in our provinces, we will have problems. So again, I would like to say that we have to transition from the household electrification thinking to something that is that will encourage commercial or business activity. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Secretary Kusi. And uh, I, I wish to uh, thank uh, Dean Mendoza as well as Dr. Yap for this opportunity to join you this, this morning. And I hope that uh, Father Jet finds this virtual FET strip as uh, one that lives up to his uh, expectations. Thank you very much, everyone.
Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion. And we hope that our audience were able to understand the energy issues better. And we are happy to receive questions from the audience. So, but we apologize if we were not able to accommodate all questions. And we will share them with our speakers and address them in the future. So on behalf of the organizing team and all the audience, we would like to thank our distinguished speakers and our moderator for gracing us with their presence. So thank you very much, Paul. And just to review, we now have around 400 viewers on Zoom and Facebook. So very, uh, we thank you very much because I know that all our speakers um, attract their own networks and their fans. <laughs> so once again, uh, please share the live stream on your Facebook account and use the hashtag Ener Energy and Sustainable Development Webinar. So moving forward to the next part of our program, I would like to call on our um, Senior Technical Advisor of the ASAP Souls Project to give us an overview. Um, so may I now call on um, Dr. Joseph Yap. So, okay. Uh, uh, share screen, share. Okay. Thank you very much, Camille. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to join everyone in acknowledging the significant uh, contributions of Father Jet, not only in enhancing uh, uh, the statue of Ateneo de Manila University, but also in promoting scientific thinking, especially in the field of climate, climate action advocacy. Okay. Uh, my role uh, this morning is to briefly describe the ACE of Cells project and discuss its possible role in supporting economic recovery in the post-pandemic world. As Dean Ron uh, earlier uh, mentioned, ASAP is uh, access to sustainability energy program and then clean energy living laboratories. Uh, we gratefully acknowledge the financial support that has been provided by the European Union. The role, uh, the overall objective of the project uh, this has been mentioned uh, several times uh, earlier this morning, uh, is to uh, empower stakeholders in the process of transitioning to a sustainable low carbon energy scenario. So the key word is transitioning and it has been mentioned, it has to be a just transition. Uh, this can be accomplished through knowledge management, which is largely uh, based on research, and then we also have uh, capacity building and advocacy. So these are the three main pillars of the Ace of Cells project. And the three areas of intervention are, you can see here, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy access. To ensure the sustainability and geographic reach of the project, even beyond its lifetime. Uh, we have engaged the assistance of several institu uh, institutions. Uh, so the Xavier University acts as or performs the role of the Mindanao cell. Uh, the University of San Carlos performs the role of the Visaya cell. Uh, the Ateneo School of Government, Government leads the Luzon cell with strong support from Manila Observatory and uh, ICLEI. Uh, my colleague, uh, after this presentation, will present uh, an update on the activities of our partners. But meanwhile, uh, we want to look at uh, how the opportunities and challenges from COVID-19 pandemic can influence our research agenda. Uh, in particular, we look at the report uh, that was published last June by the International Energy Agency. Okay. So there are several measures that were uh, proposed and analyzed in this report. Uh, some of them were uh, alluded to by our speakers in the plenary session. Uh, for example, in energy generation, the IEA argues that uh, the pandemic 
has shown that we can accelerate the growth of wind and solar energy. Uh, these sources were found largely immune to the disruptions caused by the lockdown. Uh, the role of energy efficiency is also important. Uh, it's shown here. Uh, so we mentioned that it's possible to include in stimulus packages retrofitting of existing buildings and also to promote uh, greater efficiency in new constructions. Uh, the IEA estimates that these uh, measures have very high employment effects. So in this chart, you can see that uh, building efficiency, retrofit, uh, retrofitting buildings and uh, promoting efficiency in new buildings have the highest employment impact. Okay, so you look at this menu of options, their uh, employment impact, and the government can look at various measures in order to encourage uh, uh, employment. Another important area is in terms of looking at the decentralized power technologies. Our stakeholders uh, can look at how lockdown measures have put off-grid developments at risk. So in particular, in, in particular uh, some of the projects, uh, the viability of some of these projects can be restored if they receive direct support from the government. Uh, we can look, uh, for example, at exempting solar components from duties and value added taxes. Uh, the IEA estimates that the centralized systems would create around 900,000 job years within the next three years. Given that uh, off-grid projects or decentralized power technologies are very important for the Philippines, and given that uh, the ASAP cells project has a comparative advantage in this area, uh, we can look, uh, it behooves us to look at, uh, look deeply into this issue. Uh, so with that, uh, I thank everyone for their kind attention. As my mother-in-law would say, just take me now. Back to you, Camille. Thank you very much, Dr. Jo. So now, um, I'm very pleased to give the floor or the airtime to our project manager, Ms. Maria Cecilia Benavides, to discuss what we have achieved so far to advocate clean energy in the Philippines. So, Ms. Cecilia? Okay, um, Mr. Sil, can we ask you to unmute, please? Okay, good morning again to each and every one of you. Let me share to you the accomplishment of ASIP Cells Project in the last 18 months. Next. Okay. Wait. Move. Sorry. Shy. And sorry. Again, again. God, Ms. Dean. Yeah, for a while. And sorry about that. Okay. Um, the accomplishment of ASIP Cells Project in the last 18 months first is the setting up of ASIP Cells Consortium. Um, and its institu institutionalization. The second is the development and establishment of project guidelines on systems and processes to adhere and meet the standards set by the Ateneo and the European Union. As you all know that this project is national in scope 
and with each partner having its own unique sets of deliverables. Thus, we need efficient system to work in silos. Next is the project launch, which we introduced the project to diverse um, stakeholders, and that was um, held in Xavier University in Cagayan de Oro last October 28, 2019. The next is the strategic planning among consortium partners, which, um, cal which we had a chance to calibrate midway the project outputs and identify convergent points among partners so that we cannot only maximize, not only to maximize resources, but to widen also our reach and jointly promote and advocate renewable energy, energy access and energy efficiency extensively across the country. Next is um, media visibility. ASIP Cells has been covered by various media outlets online, in print, and in television. And to reach the younger audience, we are also very active in social media, um, out, social media uh, outlets like Facebook and uh, Instagram. The next um, accomplishment is partnerships with local government units. Mindanao Cells and Ecclesias executed a memorandum of agreement with local governments of Cagayan de Oro, Bohol, and Santa, Ro Santa Rosa Laguna um, to establish demonstration site and promote energy efficiency. Another one is the uh, identification of demonstration sites and case study sites. Our Visayan Cell partner identified um, off-grid islands of uh, Gilatongan Islands, Pamotis Group of Islands as case study sites. Another one is um, as part of our knowledge management deliverables, the research publication. As early as last year, ASIP Cells published working papers entitled Managing Energy Trilemma, Evaluation of Feed-in Tariffs and Policies, energy mix optimization and market failure and political economy framework. And um, another, another accomplishment is the specialized course on energy policy. Luzon Cells in partnership with Deutsche Institute for Entwicklungspolitik conducted a workshop on the courses for specialized energy policy track for ASOM, Masters in Public Health. I think this is the first of its kind in the country in the sense that um, it would really serve the uh, energy sector professionals. Uh, perhaps here we can create a community of thought leaders, uh, advocates, and champion who could help us promote uh, transition to clean and sustainable energy. Um, another accomplish accomplishment is advocating clean energy in Mindanao. Um, Mindanao Cell promoted ASAP cells and clean energy concepts and technologies, as well as the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act to mechanical engineering student in one guild summit. Um, this is really to raise the awareness of our youth on clean energy, and that would, and we hope that would eventually gain grounds and drive change towards adoption of resilient energy systems in the future. Um, the next one is the conduct of local government for sustainability forum uh, together with the Department of Energy and ASEP Cells TA. If you've seen in this picture, they were attended by local government, uh, representatives, private sector, civil society, and academe that was held in Cebu. Uh, another one is the solar panel for off-grid communities. Uh, Visaya Cell installed and inaugurated solar panels and IT infrastructure for remote monitoring and metering on the rooftop of rooftop solar PV systems in the island of Golotongan and Cebu, which has the capacity of 7.92 kilowatt power um, initially as a pilot uh, test for 11 households uh, with electricity of 24-7. Um, this island is inhabited by 1,875 residents belonging to 342 households. This is really very tiny because this happened shortly before the ECQ and very relevant. Imagine the community in pitch dark without such intervention 
as the boats boat, boats that carry the diesel supplies to feed their generators were canceled. And even up to now, as we speak, uh, there are no um, uh, boats that flies from the island to the mainland of Cebu. This is a concrete example of how provision of energy access to this vulnerable community mean and how we can offer hopes for a new and better life for them. Likewise, it concretely as well show the benefits of decentralized energy systems to off-grid islands as it shielded them from sufferings during crisis. So um, yeah, indeed the pandemic caused uh, a dent in our project implementation, but I could say that we were quick enough to migrate to technology to be able to reach our partners as well as our um, beneficiaries. So during the lockdown, we released uh, this first newsletter entitled Transverse. Um, this recapitulated the milestones of sales project and a call for proactive response to sustainable energy. Yeah, another accomplishment is the creation of GIS maps. Uh, the Mindanao cell has uh, created GIS map for Northern Mindanao, which they would use later on for their demonstration sites. Um, on the works, the Manila Observatory is working on research papers uh, about energy gaps, climate change impacts, climate, climate commitment, competition and sector regulations overlap in the energy industry. And they are also working on roadmaps. And also the Visayan cell, they're just waiting for the ECQ to be lifted and they will soon also um, install hybrid energy systems in the island of Kauhagan to support the um, livelihood initiatives of the communities there, as well as in, in Kamotis Island to support the education system of the last mile schools. Last mile schools, these are, these are the schools attended by um, children from the indigenous families. So I mean, it would mean a lot if we could energize schools like that uh, so they could access better education um, also like uh, the rest in the mainland Cebu. I think um, this is all for now. If you know, want to know more about clean energy initiatives, please uh, visit our website or get in touch with us. That's all for now, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Phil. And we hope that through this webinar, more people are now aware of the project's goal and activities to contribute to the attainment of renewable, efficient, and accessible energy in the Philippines. So we have now come to the last part of our program. So to give his response, let us all welcome our distinguished honoree, the outgoing president of the Ateneo de Manila University, Father Jose Ramon Jet Villarin, SJ. Father Jet? Hi, uh, thank you. Wow, you know, this is the first time uh, for me that, uh, I mean, a webinar in my honor. Seryoso ba kayo? Baka, uh, um, and, and, Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you, thank you to all our uh, well, our panelists and especially also our our keynote speaker, the si Lawrence Delina. Uh, I must be really growing old because I, I know the I know I know the secretaries of energy and uh, uh, I remember I don't know are they still here? Uh, when Popo Lotilla was Secretary of Energy, he, he visited me in Cagayan de Oro. And yeah. one of the, Popo, remember that trip we went to? Of uh, course. <laughs> <laughs> we visited this facility in Cagayan de Oro. It's about a one hectare facility. Solar lahat, one hectare. No? Uh, this was early 2005, 2006, I think. Um, and what I remember was the energy was just so, I mean, it was coming down. The sun was just shining. So, the 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 house the little what the control center was air conditioned eh? and uh, the door was open sabi ko sayang yung lamig hindi libre no and daming dami namang araw eh no uh, ilang you know ilang kilowatts yung nang uh, ang uh, gumubuhos kumbaga no and, and i've seen this in many parts of mindanao just for example the water no water was just flowing down 
from the mountain. Um, and then, as we know, Mindanao is, is really a, um, um, a water, water energy uh, driven economy. But that was also a problem when there was a drought, when there would be droughts. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to say thank you again to, to, uh, to you all, uh, to Lawrence, to Secretary Wynn, to Sec Al, Sec Babes, Sec Popo, uh, our EU partners, uh, see Ron M, see Ron Mendoza, who's the Dean of the School of Government, and the job, Cecil Camille. Let me just close with a number of well, reflections. I, I really look forward to uh, stepping down uh, and, and uh, going back to, to climate climate work, and not because it's just a scientific uh, hobby for me, but it's, it's really a, a crucial issue. Um, back in the 90s, when Pinatubo erupted, you remember? Are you old enough to remember Pinatubo? Maybe Camille, no. But the oldies here, uh, uh, when Pinatubo erupted, we were really blanketed by a lot of uh, smoke. And global temperatures at that time went down. Um, we had the most beautiful sunsets because of Pinatubo. Uh, so temperatures went down uh, because of, uh, I guess, the umbrella of sulfate particles from Pinatubo. That was global. I said, wow, na the global warming. But of course we knew that that was just transient. It was a temporary uh, disturbance really. Um, after two, three years, we were back. Uh, and, and that first though, for me, that's a lesson in looking at, at systems and structures. No? Things, things keep coming back because things are, there are certain things that are systemic. Uh, this current pandemic, in a way, is a jolt, right? It's, it's a, it's a disturbance and you see demand going down, uh, carbon emissions going down several percent, but to stand on in a matter of years, they'll be back. Um, we'll be back on a trajectory that's, that's quite dangerous. So now, uh, uh, as some of you mentioned, now it's really an opportunity uh, to, I think it was Sek Al who said, this is an opportunity rather than just a problem. Pagkakataon ito. No? Anong, ano kaya pwede natin gawin? No? Kung pagkakataon nga ito. I'm not an economist, pero uh, nakita ko lang kasi, halimbawa, if stocks are down, if gasoline is down, presyo ng gasoline na mababa, maybe we can add a little, uh, you know, premium, a tax. I don't know. I'm not, um, uh, some economists would call this a carbon tax. No, that was a big problem actually in France. <laughs> Uh, when Macron tried to do that, you know, he had strikes. But now, because things are down and people are not using their cars, perhaps we can put in a, a, a policy measure such as that, which will uh, not just earn us revenue for the government, but actually, you know, we can direct that to, to, um, to popularizing these, these, uh, these renewable technologies. Uh, admittedly, you know, I've been in here for so long and when I see renewable energy projects, I call them boutique projects, eh? boutique. Kakaunti, uh, tapos mahal pa, di ba? Kasi boutique eh. um, And I hope that these island projects that we see will, will really scale up at some point. Um, and I think that if there is a push, I don't know, some kind of policy stimulus push, if, if there is a wider deployment of these technologies, the price might go down. Um, I, I always tell our students, no, yung ball pen, uh, dati mas mura pa yung fountain pen kesa sa ball pen. Then they made a lot of ball pens, the price went down. Even CDs, when the first CD came, uh, talagang tinatago ko yung isang CD. Ngayon, wala na, limasin ko na eh. Diba? So, tinata wala na, wala na gumagamit ng CD ngayon, USB na nga. Eh. So, it's really, uh, it, it's an economics problem. And I'm glad that Father Bobby Yap, who's a, actually is an environmental economist, he can probably help us. No? Uh, but he, he takes on the reins of Ateneo de Manila uh, next month. 
Uh, I'll just end with, well, sorry, may notes lang ako eh. Salamat din, Sec. Al, dun sa iyong analogy ng LED tsaka incandescent bulb. Uh, totoo yan, no? Yung sachet economics, di ba? Uh, sa mga may hirap. Uh, hindi nila kayang bumili ng mamahaling LED talaga eh. Uh, and, and perhaps here we can help because there are institutions that have deep pockets, such as government, we hope, no? um, because the poor don't have pockets. So they will not be able to afford even the clean technology. Now, Greenpeace had that blimp before. Cleaner is cheaper. Well, cleaner is cheaper. Why aren't we clean? <laughs> Uh, and because there are barriers, there are there are bottlenecks. Um, Sec Babes mentioned something about Laudato Si from Pope Francis. Yeah, I I think uh, this is now something from the point of view of someone who's not in the energy sector looking at the crisis. And he says, Pope Francis says, with much wisdom, telling us that we're in this crisis because we've discarded people. And we've discarded nature. That's the source of the crisis. We've, it's exclusion. We've marginalized the poor in development and we've marginalized nature. And, and this blind faith in technology, thinking that technology will solve our problems. So it's something for us to, to reflect on, really. Uh, the, our our development and and how it can be so exclusive or exclusionary uh, it, it can exclude so many others um he says social the social crisis is also an ecological crisis i i know it's not easy but i, I think uh, this whole issue of you know environment and, and social and environmental issues but i guess that's why We've been given much you know, uh, and as leaders to be able to wrestle with these things. I'll end with this picture. Can I show this picture? How can I do this? I'll change my background because I don't, I don't know how to, to share a screen. Eh. Uh, uh, it's a picture of uh, when I, there was a time early 2000s, I went to I live with the people in uh, Nabotas. Kita nyo ba? I, I, I would show this picture. Every yes, so Father often. Jet, we see you. Okay, sige. Ay, buti na lang, babes. Nandiyan ka. Kasi alam nyo, nung nasa Nabotas ako, um, ang tawag sa meral ko, aswang. <laughs> aswang kasi, uh, uh, these are the urban poor, no? and, and, and then they, they actually they steal electricity. They, they tap. Uh, uh, legal tapping. Marami yan, eh, di ba? Yung magagaling sila dyan, eh, ang mga electrician. So, um, syempre, that because it's illegal, eh, ang nangyayari ay may code word sila. Kasi sa looban yan, eh, no? na pag dumating yung Meralco inspector, ang code word, aswang. Aswang. So one one day, uh, dumati yung aswang, you no? Know? And so, nung dumati yung aswang, di sabi bulung bulungan, aswang 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 aswang. Siya may may meron silang protocol, no? Tatanggalin nila yung yung kuryente, yung wire, no? Tatanggalin niya yung tap. So that night brown out kami, no? Um, <laughs> and you could see that uh, well, and I, I was with these children there and. That's why the, that 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 uh, candle, um, and I thought, well, yeah, this is really this is this is our situation um, that we're so vulnerable that we have to resort even to stealing uh, electricity, and when it's done and it's gone, you know, we we well we are plunged in darkness. But one thing that sort of gave me hope was. You know, while we were there in the dark, lighting a candle, I thought that these people would, you know, these children would curse their fate. They did not. Eh? You know, we, we, we sat around that candle and then, you know, someone started dancing, singing. You know? And I thought, God, I, we're, we're so resilient in a way. 
and I think our resilience is from our from our connections, from this deep sense of community, of family, of bonds. And I think that's that's how we will adapt and and be you know flexible, so to speak. Sec uh, Senator Wynne mentioned something about flexibility, about adaptability. That's who we are. Um, and I hope you know, um, that we see we see our, our children as our inspiration. Uh, wala po akong anak, no? At wala po akong balak magka-anak. Uh, pero <laughs> uh, it's, it's really their future. Uh, you know, this is not just a theoretical thing. It, it's going to happen. Climate change is going to happen. And, and there will be a lot of volatility and insecurity. Uh, ano lang to eh? Opening salvo tong pandemic. Eh. It just showed the world how vulnerable we are. You know? um, and, and vulnerability, as you know, is differentiated. It's, you know, some people are more vulnerable than others. And, and so I hope that um, uh, I hope that this will really inspire us to, you know, just to rise from this uh, rise from this crisis. And yes, see this as an opportunity. There are many things that, that we really can do. You know, let's, let's bring our minds together. Let's look at the moonshot, whatever that moonshot is that will lead to spin-off benefits. Um, and, and maybe, just maybe, you know, uh, we, we can truly build uh, a safer and, uh, and a more inclusive and, and beautiful world. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Father Jet, and thank you for all that you have done for Ateneo. So just some last points before we close. What's a webinar without a group photo? So may I ask all our speakers uh, to open their cameras and we'll do a quick um, photo pop. <laughs> all right, so are we ready? So, to him, uh, our photographers from the other side of the room, from the other areas of Metro Manila. Okay. One, two, three, left. Okay. So, that's good. All right. So, like that. So, we will have a post event for this. And after the post event, the post so we the idea in our minds and yeah. in our own ways from our use of energy our knowledge to our network so be a clean energy advocate once again thank you very much for your time on behalf of the school of government and the SSL's team we wish you stay safe and healthy thank you Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you.